Right. Yeah. No. No. I'm really. I don't see any distinction other than that small distinction. But the reality is, where where you are in this higher, if you exercise that authority, you wouldn't be ahead very long. Yeah. No. Really. Yeah. No. Ours is driven by committee. How are the there are two parties? The bottom had administrator with one line. I think we have to come with respect to our yeah. both both parties. Okay. Ours ours report to me, um, so the committee writes a letter, but but I you know I could make a strong case. Okay. Yeah. They have have a vote, and they go to the policy committee, which is independent. Okay. I have only five to ten. Yeah. They write the policy. Yeah. Like those things, pros, cons, outcomes. Yeah. Ours is similar. Yeah. Except they they kind of go back and forth. So like I see, I see all the back. Yeah. 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 Yeah
All right, so uh, the mechanical engineering department itself is about a third of the college or the largest uh, department. And we're organized around six uh, uh, research areas. Uh, bioengineering is a big one um, for us uh, because one of the uh, unique things about UK is we're one of only seven universities that have all of the professional schools together. So, you know, medicine, dentistry, law, business, everything is on one campus under one fiscal umbrella. So collaborative work ends up being fairly easy. Um, so we, we have a lot of faculty with joint appointments in Department of Surgery, for example, and, and doing, uh, doing biomedical research. Um, uh, we have a large group in autonomous systems that's with uh, electrical engineering, computer science, uh, doing uh, drone um, swarms for uh, sensing. Um, uh, clean combustion, uh, carbon sequestration is, is a large project. And then in aerospace, um, computational hypersonics and materials for hypersonics are areas that um, have a uh, big focus. So I kind of sit between the combustion and hypersonics group doing uh, combustion for gas turbine engines, um, but also recently doing some diagnostics for um, hypersonic materials, thermal protection systems. But today I'm going to talk about um, work on uh, combustion for gas turbine engines, particularly for uh, military uh, jet engines. Um, so this, uh, when I talk about augmenters, um, we're talking about afterburners and looking at combustion uh, stability um, inside of, of these uh, thrust augmenters. So just a quick um, Thermo 2 refresher here. Um, so commercial uh, gas turbine engines operate on a Brayton cycle with a compressor, combustor, and turbine um, to generate uh, shaft uh, work. And for a commercial engine, almost all of the thrust comes from a fan on the front of the engine. So the, the, the main components, the compressor, the turbine, and um, combustor section are really just there as a power plant to generate shaft work, and the vast majority, 95% of the thrust, comes from pushing air through this fan. So when you get on a commercial plane, the blades you see are the fan blades as opposed to the core um, engine components. And so the bigger this is, the more efficient um, the engine is. So we want high mass flow rates um, pushed through that, and so we're only limited by you know, making sure that blade tips, you know, say subsonic, um, and so on bigger engines, you'll see these things become you know, um, you know, 14 feet in diameter or so on the largest uh, GE engines. And so that's what makes them efficient. Um, conversely, for uh, military engines, for fighter jets, um, what we're not interested in fuel efficiency, we're interested in performance. Um, so you want high maneuverability, high acceleration capabilities. So F equals MA. Um, if you want high A, you need high F and low M. Um, so you can't afford to have this large uh, uh, fan on the front because of its massive weight and the speeds at which you can you know, change, um, change directions. Um, so in the military jet engine, you know, largely you have the same uh, kind of core, uh, you know, compressor, combustor, turbine, but the difference is um, this is uh, designed only to produce enough power to uh, just push air through the engine but not to have leftover power on the shaft. Okay, so it's a, it does not have a power plant to produce uh, shaft work. Instead, um, it uh, leaves all that extra enthalpy that would have been used to generate shaft work in the, in the gases. So we have higher temperature gases coming out the back, um, higher pressures um, because the turbine will not um, extract as much work from, from the gas. And that's used uh, through a nozzle for direct thrust um, out the back of the engine. Um, it's less efficient um, to produce thrust this way, uh, but it produces a lot better performance in terms of acceleration. Um, so the other thing that these have, and this is where my work comes in, is the thrust augmenter or the afterburner. Um, so if you're just trying to produce as much acceleration as you can, um, you um, want to take advantage of all of the oxygen in the flow, and the core of the engine only um, uses uh, maybe a third to a half at the most of the oxygen that flows through that, so the gases coming off the turbine still have on the order of 15 to um, percent or so oxygen remaining in the gas stream. And so we can generate additional thrust um, with the augmenter, which is just a fuel injected into the flow to produce a larger increase in enthalpy, more thrust out the back. So um, uh, under optimum conditions, you can almost double the thrust um, from the engine with the augmenter at a cost of seven times the fuel usage per unit thrust. So horrible idea from an efficiency standpoint, um, but great for uh, mission critical um, uh, parts uh, where you need high acceleration. So taking off, landing on aircraft carriers, 
um, you know, uh, rapid pursuit, things like that. All right, so um, one of the challenges with um, augmenters is their flame uh, stability, and this is uh, what we've been working on for, uh, for probably about 15 years now. Uh, looking at uh, what conditions uh, lead to stable operation of the combustion in, in the augmenter. Um, and there's lots of things that can lead to unstable uh, modes of operation. Um, it can have acoustic issues uh, because the afterburner is closed on one end and open on the other acoustically. Um, so it, it supports uh, very easily longitudinal acoustic modes and you can get vibrations that um, can, can rupture um, hardware in the engine. Those, that's, that's one type of instability. Uh, the, the one we're looking at, though, uh, for purposes of this talk today is, is a, a problem called blow-off. Um, and so the, the basic uh, premise is, is the following. The augmenter is simple. You know, we're going to spray fuel in, let it evaporate, mix with the air, and then we want to burn it. But the gases are moving faster than flame speeds at those conditions. And so we need something in the flow to create a low-velocity region that can stabilize the flame. And that's what the flame holder is. And so our flame holder here you know, um, in our academic burner is just a simple triangle. But even in, in, uh, commercial or in, uh, in real engines, they're not much more complicated than that. You can have flame holders that are simple you know, V-gutters of you know, metal. Uh, just something to create an obstruction in the flow. Flow has to go around it. You get a recirculation zone behind it. So there's low velocities and the flame can stabilize. And so at a simple level, you can think about this recirculation zone stabilizing the flame by holding the high temperature gases um, that are produced when um, this uh, afterburner flame is burning and put, bringing those back to reignite or to keep the flame um, attached to the, the flame holder. And so if, as, as long as there's enough time um, for the combustion to occur, uh, then this can be a continuous process and, and stay, stay lit. But if uh, the gases coming um, through are too fast, there won't be enough time for the combustion to occur and the flame will detach from the flame holder. So at a, at a certain operating condition, if we have a, a stable flame, we keep increasing the velocity. Eventually, the flame will detach and, and do what we call blow off. Um, and so what that looks like um, in physically is the following. So this is a famous picture that anybody who does bluff body stability work always has in their, in their slide deck. So this is a um, SR-71 Blackbird that had, a, had one of these blow-off events. So these, these happen where some condition led to the flame detaching from the afterburner and just literally blowing out the back of the engine. Um, this is bad um, for, <laughs> for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, like I said, half of the thrust comes from the augmenter, so suddenly this, you know, this plane has lost half the thrust on one side, so you can get violent yawing um, on, on the aircraft itself. But also, um, afterburners are, like I said, horribly fuel inefficient, so they're typically only used at very critical times. You know, the SR-71 was unique in that it cruised with afterburners on, but most, um, you know, most fighter jets use them for takeoff and landing um, situations, so losing an afterburner when you're trying to get off an aircraft carrier obviously is not a good, good time to have that happen. Um, so uh, how do they address this issue? Um, the afterburners are, as simple as they are, a really interesting problem because it, it ends up being a systems level um, issue of what are the conditions going to be coming off the turbine and, what is, um, and how is this design going to perform when I put an afterburner on the end of an engine. And what happens in the development of, an, of a new engine is the afterburner gets designed on paper, but until the engine's actually being produced, um, you don't learn about all of the stability issues that the afterburner has, and it's too late to change the engine. So afterburners are always a problem at the very end when engines are already in production having to um, improve their performance. Um, and, and, and so the work that we've done here was uh, related to that development time period on the F-35, um, the, the Joint Strike Fighter engine. Um, so it, ha it had some stability issues, and we were working with Pratt & Whitney to, to try to resolve them. So ultimately, uh, what the um, engine manufacturer wants to do is to understand where are the limits of the um, augmenter stability, um, try to improve the designs to expand those limits as much as we can, but wherever we you know, get to on the final engine, program the engine controls to not go beyond those points. Um, so they have a, a stable flight envelope for where the augmenter will operate and regions that it won't operate, and they try to avoid um, portions of the flight envelope that where 
where it would be unstable. So this is a, a typical static stability curve for augmenter operation. And uh, the way you can think about this is the data points are the boundaries between a flame that's attached and stable, which would be up in this corner, and one that is blown off, which would be down in, in this corner. Um, so for this data here, um, you can imagine at a specific fuel air ratio at a certain operating point of the engine, over here the flame is stable. As I increase the velocity, which we've cast here as a Reynolds number, um, I'll eventually hit a high enough velocity that the flame will become unstable and blow off. Or conversely, if I'm sitting at a specific uh, flow rate, and I start leaning out the mixture, less and less fuel eventually won't produce enough heat um, to keep the flame stable and it'll blow out. Okay. So uh, the data points here are um, for conditions where the gases coming into the augmenter are cold. So this is room temperature air, um, not at all realistic of what you would see in an engine. And the curve through that is this uh, classic correlation from the literature, um, Hazawa correlation for uh, bluff body flame stability from the 70s or so. So we've, we've been working on this problem um, for you know, 50 years. There's uh, data on, on augmenter stability. So for the academic condition of room temperature air coming into a, um, a flame holder, we understand that one pretty well. There's good curves for, for the behavior. Um, what's interesting, though, is when we go to real conditions um, and looking at the gases that are coming off of a turbine and into the augmenter, um, we get a much broader range of conditions. Um, so, for one, um, the gases are going to be hot. You know, we've gone through a combustor, um, we've come through a turbine, um, but there's still lots of leftover um, enthalpy in that flow, and, and the, the gases are, can, be, can be quite hot. Um, but the turbine did extract enthalpy to produce uh, uh, work to drive the compressor, and so it's not an adiabatic mixture. Um, so, when we talk about these mixtures that have been partially burned, we refer to that as a vitiated mixture, so it has a mix of um, some you know, leftover air, um, combustion products, water, CO2, uh, but the air composition will be less than, than just, uh, or the oxygen content will be less than air, so it'll be you know, something in the 15% range. Um, so this is a curve that we would get for a vitiated case that's adiabatic. Um, so we burned some um, fuel in the air, uh, we still have 15% oxygen left, but we didn't extract any enthalpy out of it. So that's the hottest condition at which you would have that mixture. And so you'll see that it is a much more stable condition. Um, so for the same um, uh, fuel air mixture, you could you know, propagate where that curve would be out here and you could get to much, much higher velocities um, and the flame still stay attached. Um, and that makes sense because you're, you're mixing your fuel and air in with something that's already hot, so you don't need as much heat from the, um, from the afterburner flame to keep things uh, stable. Um, but here is the conditions that match more closely what you would really see in the augmenter, which is that we vitiated it, um, so we have a lower oxygen, um, uh, we have lower oxygen content, uh, that uh, is not the correct value there. Um, but then we have removed some enthalpy uh, from it um, with the turbine, and so it ends up coming up here somewhere. Um, the challenge is this line in, in the real world can be anywhere from the adiabatic line to even uh, above the cold line, depending on how much enthalpy has been pulled out of out of that flow, and so trying to predict where this is is the is the challenge. So um, this was kind of state of the art modeling of augmenter stability um, about ten years ago or so. So the the Air Force uh, pulled a bunch of data from the literature. Um, like I said, we've been uh, putting augmenters on gas turbine engines since they existed. So there's you know, there's a lot of, of data on on uh, this kind of bluff body uh, flame stability. Uh, going back, um, you know, into the 50s, um, uh, there's data from uh, DOD, Air Force, um, but also uh, NACA, the precursor to NASA, had, had a bunch of uh, experiments on this. And this curve here is all of that data from the literature um, on bluff body stability at different conditions, and you know, run through a model that tries to predict what the stability would be at those conditions, and so it's uh, predicted blow-off equivalence ratio versus actual blow-off equivalence ratio. Um, and this state-of-the-art um, model at the time um, was 100% empirical. So there's no, there's no physics in the model. It's, it's just a curve fit with you know, non-physical exponents on temperature and oxygen content and bluff body diameter and velocities to try to get the data to collapse uh, best you can. Um, and it does a reasonably good job because this, this is... is Lots of different size combustors, lots of different shapes on the bluff body. 
um, lots of different conditions for vitiation and, and the amount of enthalpy that's been removed from the flow. So it's not bad as far as correlations go, but it's not good enough. Um, if you look at um, operating conditions that you might actually consider around, say, 0.8 equivalence ratio, um, you can see that your um, spread is all the way from 0.7 to 1. Um, so the uncertainty on this, of this model as a design tool is just not sufficient. So um, one of the things that we have done is to try to do a better job of creating a model for flame stability that, does, um, that uses more physics. You know, so, so instead of just trying to empirically uh, predict when the flame blows off, we want to predict why it's blowing off um, so that the model can better um, predict for different conditions. So the experiment we're looking at is um, our academic <laughs> augmenter. Uh, we have uh, air come in, um, comes into a, pr a pre-burner section, and uh, we just inject some propane into that and, um, and burn this in a commercial uh, burner, um, let it uh, mix out and stabilize, and then we have a heat exchanger to remove enthalpy from the flow. So this is our turbine. Um, it's a, just a bank of cold water flowing through some tubes, and we can control the temperatures to, to remove the amount of enthalpy we want to remove. That gets converged down to our test section where we have um, some additional fuel injectors to, to uh, uh, mix in fuel that would be as we would have in the augmenter, and then a bluff body flame holder in a, um, in a test chamber that has uh, quartz on three sides so that we can do optical diagnostics. And so that's a picture of the flame actually operating right here. And then the diagnostics, uh, the simplest one is just um, high-speed imaging. So we just have a high-speed camera and a photomultiplier tube to detect when the flame blows out. Um, and we create blowout by um, changing the equivalence ratio slightly. So we set at a certain operating velocity, we get a stable flame, and we decrease the amount of fuel that we're injecting into that so that we're stepping down equivalence ratio at, by 0 0.01, and then we hold that for several seconds. And the flame doesn't blow out, we step down again. Um, so you can consider any blowout event that we see as essentially occurring um, in a steady, a steady mixture. The changes are slow enough um, for for that not to be significant. Um, but then when the flame blows off, you know the light goes away, uh, and we stop the camera and, and collect the um, the images. And uh, so this is a, an example of one movie of that. Um, it's fairly low resolution because these end up being big data files and have to bend them to be able to get them on, uh, to show on the computer fairly well. But the uh, flow is coming in from uh, left to right. We have a triangular bluff body uh, holder here, and um, the flow recirculates. There's a recirculation zone, and the flame largely burns in the shear layer in the two regions here. So we're going to see this blow out in just a minute, but the thing I want you to note is that it, it goes from um, kind of looking, uh, having this uh, vortex uh, shedding, um, so this von Karman vortex streak that sheds um, off the two sides of the bluff body, you'll see that pop up in the flame shape um, uh, significantly, and then the flame will kind of break here and then kind of uh, burn in the recir recirculation zone for a second, recede back to the bluff body, and then also blow out uh, the back. So I'll just play that from the middle again. If I can find what's the, it. What's the diagnostic? This, this is just flame emission, so it's just, it's just a high-speed camera looking at the chemiluminescence. Uh, so largely it's CH emission, because um, it's, uh, uh, it's a visible camera, so we don't see um, any of the OH. Um, but you'll see the, the uh, vortex um, behavior in the flame kind of come and go, um, and that's, that's fairly important, as we'll see in the more detailed diagnostics that we do, um, and I'll show in just a minute. Um, so one of the questions that we had um, in this research is, is that important? Um, is the vortex shedding that we see um, a cause of the flame being unstable or an effect of the flame already being unstable. And so just quickly, um, in, a, in a flow like this around a bluff body, if this were cold, you would usually see vortex shedding around that event. Um, so you see vor uh, vortices shed in a Struhall number of about 0.2, and so there's a certain, you know, for a given size and a different velocity, you can, you know, uh, predict what frequency those vor vortices would be shed at. Um, but when you have uh, combustion occurring, um, the temperature gradient suppresses uh, that vorticity. So normally um, with a flame behind a bluff body, you don't see that vorticity. Um, and so the, one of the questions in the research um, that we're trying to address is, are the vortices um, uh, coming up because the flame is already blowing off and it's getting cooler, 
And so now the mechanism that suppresses the vorticity is not as strong, and then we see the vorticity. Or is the vorticity um, occurring earlier in the process and helping drive uh, blow off? And the reason that's an important question is you need to know whether your model to predict blow off needs to include vorticity or it doesn't. If, if it's an effect and not a cause, then you don't care. It's just one of the things that's happening you know, as, as it blows off. What's the temperature? It's, it's how much temperature? Um, so for these, uh, it's probably about 2300 Kelvin or so. So don't you see the wall? How do you make sure the wall remains cooler? Oh, the wall, the wall's hot. Um, you mean like the bluff body wall? No, no, the wall um, through which you're seeing the camera. Uh, yeah, yeah. So um, so the, the bluff body is about uh, four inches uh, long. And so any of the diagnostics we're doing are on a plane in the middle. Um, and that's far enough away that heat, heat loss from that part is, is negligible. Uh, but you do have wall heat loss issues at the ends of the bluff body. Um, so it's, it's, not, it's not perfectly you know, a symmetric plane in that direction. So I'm wondering why the bottom has small signal. Yeah, um, so it's a little beyond what, uh, there's some other experiments that we did. Um, so one of the other things that we were looking at is the effects of non-uniform uh, fueling, uh, because the, the fuel spray is really close to the bluff body in practice, and you don't have enough time for that to fully mix out, so you get rich in lean regions. So, so we um, have our fuel injectors very close to our bluff body, so that we can provide non-uniform fueling for asymmetry tests. Um, one of the consequences of that is because we designed this to be able to study asymmetry, it's almost impossible to make it symmetric. <laughs> really, really hard to, to make it good and symmetric. If, if that's what we were interested in doing, we would have put these uh, far upstream so it had plenty of time to mix out. Um, so that's just a residual effect of uh, a little bit of asymmetry in fueling. And that's what this G parameter is, is, the, um, is a non-dimensional term on, on F fuel asymmetry. Um, all right, so um, the, the way we address the question first of is vorticity important is just through these high-speed image, um, images. Um, and so we use a technique, proper orthogonal decomposition, to break the images up and try to separate the vorticity uh, from other things that are going on in the flow. Um, and so POD is, is just a linear decomposition um, approach to looking at data in the same way uh, Fourier decomposition uh, works. Uh, you know, where you would describe a time series as a sum of sine waves with different amplitudes and phases. Um, POD works in the same way, except you let the data tell you what mode shapes to use. So in Fourier, you use, you pre-choose that I'm going to use sine waves. And so if you have a complicated system, you might need to add up hundreds of these to be able to represent the data. In POD, you start with the data set you want to describe, and it's an eigenvalue problem to compute what are the mode shapes that most compactly represent that data. And so what you get out of a POD analysis are mode shapes. And since we're looking at images, the modes are two-dimensional. And um, so, so this, this is the most important mode, the second most, the third most, and, and so on. And then once I have those mode shapes, I, I lock those in and I take, uh, take a movie, uh, like the one I just showed, and you decompose each frame of that onto these modes. So each time in the movie, is just a set of, of constants, so an array of constants that says um, how much of this, 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 and this you add together to get that uh, frame. Um, so, so typically with POD in turbulent flows, it's, it doesn't um, always give you a nice, clean physical representation of what's going on. The modes aren't always easy to interpret. Um, but in a, in a flow where you have a periodic event occurring, like a vortex shedding, it really works uh, very well. Um, you can usually find that periodic feature and pull it out very easily. So in our case, uh, mode one looks more or less like the average stable burning flame. Um, mode three and four are the vortex shedding modes, and I'll, I'll show you that in just a second. But you can see they have almost the same shape, but uh, they're shifted from one another by a one quarter of the wavelength of the vorticity. Um, so just like with Fourier decomposition, if I take a sine wave and a cosine wave, and I uh, change the constants on it, you can, you can make a time series of a propagating wave. Exact same thing here. You know, with the right constants, this can describe the full motion of, of vortex shedding, just those two modes. And then, um, I, I won't demonstrate here, but this, this mode represents the case where the flame is blowing off the back end. So these dark regions are negative values that subtract intensity and burning dominantly in the recirculation zone. So it's kind of this uh, point when the flame actually uh, uh, breaks and, and starts to recede. Um, 
So uh, the nice thing about POD is you can do all sorts of uh, fun games after the fact to kind of confirm what, uh, what the modes mean and what you're seeing. So this is a reconstructed movie of the exact same video I just showed, except it only uses modes one, three, and four. So, so this, this movie, each frame of it is the only thing that's different from any one frame to any other are just three constants um, to describe this. Otherwise, we're adding together uh, those, those modes, and that's it. And so what you'll see is it, um, you know, a lot of the fine detail goes away because I've thrown, you know, the vast majority of the data away. Um, but you still see the vortex shedding. Um, that looks fairly normal. Um, what you, and, but when the flame uh, finally goes out, what you'll see is because we aren't keeping the modes about the flame breaking in the middle or burning in the recirculation zone, you won't see that behavior at all. The flame will just kind of fade away in intensity. Um, you know, so we can confirm then that, okay, these, these modes represent the vortex shedding. They don't represent anything having to do with the blow-off process. And you can go through that with each of the modes and kind of confirm that what the mode physically represents is meaningful. And so then we can take that entire data set and, and look at it just in terms of a time series of the constants. And we can see how the physical processes are related to one another. And so uh, this is a point that's far from blow off. So that movie I showed you was 70 milliseconds in total length uh, from beginning to end. So the blow off processes are, are fairly quick. Um, and so when I'm far from blow off at 70 milliseconds away, um, you can see the uh, magnitude of the time constant representing mode one is like 0.8 to 0.9. So the flame largely looks like a stable burning flame. Um, and, and the red line here is one of the vort vorticity modes, three or four, I can't, I can't read that up there. Um, but you can see that it'll come in intensity, you'll have vortex shedding and it'll go away. And it'll come back in intensity and you'll have vortex shedding and it'll go away. Um, and you can physically see that, you know, visually just watching the movie, but here you can quantify how um, the importance of that process. Um, and so what's interesting, if we zoom into this region, we see that um, when blow-off occurs, of course, the uh, mode one constant drops off dramatically because the flame stops looking like a stable flame. Um, and mode two um, increases. The flame goes to this process where the flame breaks and dies off. And then mode five, which is the flame uh, receding into the recirculation zone, then comes up. And then everything goes away when the flame is finally blown off. But the order in which those occur and how they're related to each other can help decipher which physical processes are preceding which and which, one, uh, which ones are important. And so what we always see in every movie is that the vortex shedding starts. Um, it, it slowly increases in intensity. You can see the maximum amount of this uh, value is going up. Um, just prior to uh, the flame breaking, um, the vortex shedding and the flame uh, mode one, the stable flame, couple with one another, and they both um, start oscillating together, and then the flame breaking occurs. Okay, So it's strong evidence that the vortex shedding is preceding um, and likely um, helping to cause the blow-off as opposed to occurring after the blow-off has occurred. So this tells us, okay, vortex shedding is important, um, so now we want to look at how is vortex shedding causing um, the flame blow-off process and make sure we understand what features we need to capture in the model. So for this, we use more sophisticated diagnostics. Um, we're using a, a planar laser-induced fluorescence with a tunable uh, laser to look at OH. Um, so this is going to tell us where the flame is instantaneously. And we're using a particle image velocimetry with a, another laser. These are formed into sheets. So we get simultaneous velocity and OH um, information. Happy to go into those diagnostics. Uh, more later, but I'm kind of jump into some results here. Um, so these images are turned vertically. The flow is coming from the um, bottom to the top um, here. And so the, the red uh, color is the OH uh, PLIF signal. And so this tells us um, where um, the OH molecule is. And OH is produced during the combustion process, um, but it's destroyed relatively slowly. So as long as the gas remains hot, you, you tend to still have a, a high amount of of OH, so it tells you where the where the hot gas is formed by the flame are. So the boundary of, of this uh, OH contour is the flame front, um, but in the recirculation zone, you still continue to have um, uh, high amounts of, of OH. And then the green arrows are all the individual velocity vectors um, that we can uh, see on this. So this is a flame that's um, stable. We are far from the extinct or the blow off limit, and we uh, can find the contour of OH and use that as a marker of where the instantaneous flame front is, that's the black line, and then the blue and red are contours of vorticity. 
And so far from blow off, what we see is that the flame always sits outside of the vorticity that's, that's in the shear layer between the recirculation zone and the gases uh, coming around it. And so, so the vorticity is largely um, um, inside of the flame and in closer to the recirculation zone. But when we get close to blow off, and this is an annoying experiment. Um, the the, the high-speed imaging is easy because you run the camera, every time you have a blow off event, you get a whole movie. Um, this experiment is with 10 hertz lasers and blow off occurs you know, over tens of milliseconds. So you're just running this thing nonstop and hope, hoping to catch a laser shot at the right time and laser later piecing it all together. Um, so, you know, thank goodness for students. Um, so, <laughs> but, uh, but what happens in, in this case when we get close to uh, blow off is, uh, that we're, remember we're leaning the flame out, so blow off occurs with a leaner mixture. So the flame speed is a little less than a stable flame. So the flame angle uh, changes and the, fl uh, the flame gets wrapped up in this uh, vorticity that's, that's in the shear layer. And so you can see in these flames that are undergoing uh, blow off, these are in the middle of that process, that the flame front is wrapped up in, in that uh, vorticity. And so we, so we believe it's the vorticity in, in the shear layer that is wrapping up the flame and helping to drive uh, that process. And how that creates um, uh, blow off is uh, the vorticity um, applies strain to uh, the flame sheet that um, competes with the chemical time scale and at, certain, at a certain limit, the flame will, will um, extinguish locally um, if that strain is too high. And so we have done analysis on what the conditional strain rates are and have shown that the strain rates in these uh, vortex wrapped regions do exceed what we expect to be extinction strain rate limits. Okay, so like cutting to the, the final conclusion on this, um, we worked with some uh, people doing their bluff, uh, bluff body design at uh, United Technologies Research Center. Um, so this is you know, the research arm of, of Pratt & Whitney. Um, and uh, they, um, instead of doing augmenter design in the way they had been doing, which was uh, simply to use these correlations based on flow rates and equivalence ratios to set limits, um, this is a vortex element uh, model uh, that's uh, predicting a 2D flow field um, and each one of these red and blue dots are one of these Lagrangian vortex elements. Um, so it's a Lagrangian model that um, propagates vortex elements to the flow. At any time, you can integrate that to get an instantaneous uh, velocity field. And then on top of that, they're doing a calculation of where the flame is and time marching that flame based on its local flame speed. Um, but anywhere where the flame, ex um, the uh, local uh, strain rate exceeds a predetermined limit, this extinction strain rate, they break the flame and remove one of the flame um, elements at that point and let the flame um, extinguish through that uh, process. And so you can see that model captures the physics that we see in our experiments, which is far from blow off, the flame front sits outside the dominant uh, vorticity. Um, as you get close to blow off, in this case they're doing it by increasing velocity, um, it starts to wrap up inside the vorticity and then it tends to break at this point a couple of bluff body diameters downstream. Um, and um, so that kind of captures what, you know, what we see in the experiments. So using this model, um, they ran all of the conditions that we see in our experiments for different vitiations, different enthalpy removals, and, and match all of those conditions. So essentially with one model um, anchored to the cold case, they can also predict, you know, there's, there's some variation, but they, they get essentially the quantitative difference between vitiated cases and cold cases with, with that model. Are they assuming perfectly mixed? Uh, this they're assuming perfectly mixed, yeah. So they're... It's not. It's not, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's, some subtle, there's some subtle differences there um, for sure, but, uh, but largely it's the same, it's the same conditions best we, can, best we can match. So in this case, in the new experiment, uh, does... Uh, does the onset of extinction happen close to the bluff body or far away and it propagates? Uh, it happens a couple of bluff body diameters downstream. Um, so usually, typically, near the end of the recirculation zone is where you see the flame break in these cases. Yeah, and then it, so then it kind of propagates back toward the the bluff body flame holder, and then once it's broken, that stuff just blows out the back. But the but the prop, but it, that extinction point propagates back down forward. So when you have a higher speed, you, 
you said that vortices kind of start to wrap up, uh, wrap around the flame. So it's just like basically scale, so they get more intense and larger, and then they can capture. Because initially you don't have it wrapped around the flame. No, initially, initially you don't. It's on the inside. On the inside. Yeah, it's on the inside. So in this case, they're increasing the velocity, um, and so that also changes the flame angle. So it's, it's just a balance of flame speed to, to velocity that causes that interaction initially. Yeah. All right, so I'm going to quickly add, and go through one more uh, topic. Um, so this, this works really well, and this is now their design tool uh, for these, so that, that's you know, really cool. But it still has um, an arbitrary parameter that's put in, which is this extinction strain rate. So, so the model still has an if statement that says, you know, if the vortex or if the local strain exceeds X, then I'm going to break the flame artif artificially. There's not a it's not a direct calculation of that uh, chemical time scale, and so that um, led to some follow-on work to look at what are the exact local conditions that create that initial flame pole, and how does the flame then uh, recede? How does the, how do these flame poles uh, propagate? And so this is some, some work that I've done in my lab experimentally. Um, and we see the evidence in our bluff body, but there's a lot of computational work in the literature as well, looking at DNS of, of uh, turbulent flames to look at this um, onset of flame holes. So historically, how this has been done, the determination of an extinction strain rate, so how, how hard can I squeeze on a flame with, uh, with velocity gradients before it goes out, this has um, been done with uh, counterflow uh, combustors. Um, so this is a, you know, a, a canonical academic experiment that, that uh, we, we all do in combustion labs where we have uh, two opposing nozzles, and this can either be fuel and air, this is a non-premix flame, where you can have premixed fuel and air on both sides and you end up with twin premixed flames. Um, but there's a stagnation uh, of, um, region in the middle where these flows um, come together and the flame can stabilize in that stagnation region. So it's far from the walls. It's a nice adiabatic uh, flame. Um, it's easy to change conditions. You get diagnostics into it. It's one dimensional for modeling. You know, these, these are great you know, for solving the problems that you can solve with them. But historically, um, extinction strain rates have been determined by you know, lighting a flame like this and slowly increasing the velocities until extinction happens. Um, and when it happens, it happens on the center line and the flame just rapidly goes out. So experimentally you do this, you're turning the knobs and poof, the flame's gone, okay? Um, and, that's, and then you look at the flow conditions and say, okay, the extinction strain rate for this fuel at these conditions is this number. The problem with that is the um, condition here at the center is peculiar um, and not representative of the locations on a flame sheet and a practical burner. And uh, the reason is that on, in the flame sheet in the augmenter uh, flame, as an example, um, extinction occurs downstream a bit. And so if I look at what's going on in that flame sheet, the flow is being squeezed by the vorticity and the flow um, from the, in, in the outer parts of the, of the uh, combustor and that does produce strain on the flame, but there's also flow along the flame sheet. So the parts of the flame that have already burned near the bluff body are carrying heat along the flame sheet. So at this extinction point, it's not um, like the stagnation flow where there's, um, at, at this very center, no flow at all. You know, it's the zero velocity. Um, so there's heat transfer mechanisms occurring in the flame sheet that don't exist on the center line of this burner. So, uh, so we've done a whole series of work in these uh, where we just changed where the extinction point is created to better mimic what happens in a flame sheet. So in this case, we have an annular burner uh, with center nozzles that are kept at relatively low velocities and outer nozzles of the same mixtures that have increased velocities. So in this case, you start at the center with a stable flame and you go out radially and the strain rate gradually increases along that uh, flame sheet due to the velocity gradient and eventually you get extinction um, but this is, is more like what you see in, in the real flow, where I have a flame burning upstream carrying hot gases into the extinction point. And um, we've done a, a lot of numerical simulations on, on this to understand that point. One of, the, one of the great disappointments in my career, I'm a diagnostician by training, and this problem, of course, we threw every diagnostic at it, did line Raman, imaging, clip, EIV. We validated the model, but everything useful we learned about this came out of the, out of the um, simulation. Um, so it's unfortunately um, a case where the numericists were better off than, than we were. So I'm going to skip the validation stuff uh, in the interest of time and just jump to uh, uh, what we learned from the simulations. 
So uh, this is this is a, um, an energy budget along that flame sheet. Uh, so zero is the center of the flame where we have this peculiar stagnation point. Um, and at that point, the flame is producing heat. So uh, um, omega dot triple prime is the um, reaction rate um, of the of the um, chemistry times the amount of enthalpy that's uh, produced there, released there. And so this is a production term, chemical heat release. And that's exactly balanced by uh, thermal diffusion away from the um, uh, axis or along the axis. <coughs> As we go out radially, though, we start to get flow along the flame, and that doesn't do anything initially. You know, so if you're just in a stable flame, you're just carrying some heat that you produced in in the flame. It's at a certain temperature, and you're carrying it along in uh, regions of the flame that are also at the same temperature. So the amount of, of heat that's advected in is the same as the amount that's advected out, and it doesn't do anything in your energy budget. Um, so it doesn't change anything. But when you um, when you go through extinction, something interesting happens, which is now I'm going um, through the flame sheet. It's starting to extinguish, and so the temperature is going down. Um, along the flame sheet. So that means that the heat that's being carried from upstream from the stable burning flame is coming at a, um, from a higher temperature than the heat is leaving. Um, and so there's a net heat gain at that um, point from the stable flame upstream. And so what we found that that does is it significantly increases the amount of strain that you have to provide onto the flame to cause it to extinguish. Because when you first start to um, have, have the strain and you get to the normal extinction limit, you have this additional process, heat, heat flow along the flame, that's helping to keep that uh, stabilized. And at practical conditions, um, like in an augmenter flame, uh, this can be a, a multiple of you know, five to 10 in terms of the strain rate that can cause extinction. So the counterflow flame experiments can be way off in terms of predicting correctly what the conditions are that, that create this extinction point. And so we've done a lot of work to characterize uh, that advective heat uh, uh, term and its impact on extinction uh, strain rates or scale dissipation rates. And the stuff we're working on right now is extending that to turbulent flows, um, you know, because of course the augmenter flames are, are turbulent, and so this strain is not a static phenomena. It's coming from, you know, a fluctuations in the flow, these vortices, you know, come and go. And so the, the strain rate um, goes through very um, large uh, swings at different time scales. And so we have a burner in my lab now that we're looking at um, uh, where we create a flame sheet in, uh, in a mixing layer between uh, fuel and air on the two sides, um, and then have controllable turbulent intensity jets coming from the two sides with the same fuel and air mixture. So we're able to create um, a strain on the flame sheet in a turbulent flow, but not um, with changes in, in uh, dilution or, or chemistry. So it's the same flows coming in. So we have some turbulent generating grids that we can put in here with different conditions and change the, the turbulence levels. Um, so we do um, some poor man's tomography on this uh, with just three views uh, to, um, to be able to get the local shape of the flame sheet, find these extinction points, um, and, and uh, to look at these flame poles. And so the interesting thing from this is that with turbulent flows, we, we still see the same effect that um, advection along the flame sheet extends uh, the, um, the extinction uh, stability limits. But what's interesting is that um, the response of the flame to these fluctuations in, in extinction or in strain rate uh, depends very much on the frequencies of those fluctuations. I mean, this isn't surprising, but there's, there are certain time scales associated with uh, the flame's response to a fluctuation in the flow. So if the fluctuations are fast, the flame can essentially write out a really large um, uh, instantaneous uh, strain value without extinguishing because it doesn't have enough time to extinguish. Um, and so slower fluctuations um, are more important. And so um, the turbulence spectra and, and where the energy is and, and how that um, translates to the strain rate is really important to, to getting that uh, right. So it's not sufficient to know just the bulk strain rate um, or the maximum strain rate, you really need to know the time scale associated with those strain rate values uh, to be able to predict um, these, these limits. Um, so we're working now on trying to characterize this more fully um, and that essentially would replace this arbitrary number. So instead of just having a, if strain rate equals this value, um, create a flame hole, 
Um, it would instead look at the turbulent spectra, filter it appropriately, and have a, 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 a more quantitative and transportable you know, criteria for, for when the flame extinguishes. All right, so that's um, uh, everything I'm presenting. Um, I'll um, uh, just summarize that you know, this, is, this work's all been motivated by um, augmenter flames you know, and, and, bluff and uh, flame stability. Uh, but there are other areas where where this applies, um, you know, to, to uh, you know, flame holders with bluff bodies are are used in, in other applications, um, you know. So this this does have have other other um, merits, but um, but this uh, you know through the numerical simulations we're able to show, you know, how the flows create these local extinction events, how they differ uh, from from that of traditional counterflow flames, and then you know going back to the first part of the talk how that drives these extinction processes in practical augmenters. Um, this has been a project for many years, uh, lots of collaborators. Um, so the bluff body experiments, um, most of those were, were done at, at UConn um, yeah, about five years ago. Um, some, of the, some of the work has been ongoing since then. And then the edge flame experiments, uh, looking at uh, hole formation, uh, has been done in my group over, over a wide number of years, including continuing uh, now. So I'll stop there and happy to take any questions. Oh, um, yeah, so we, we can do uh, temperature measurements. In the flame is easy because we can do like multicolored cliff, you know, from OH or something. Upstream, um, in the practical burner, uh, we would use a physical probe as opposed to an optical approach. So we have thermocouples in for upstream uh, temperature. Um, it's, it's a little more difficult to do quantitative upstream temperatures without some kind of tracer. You can do ramen, but in, in these flows, it's too messy. So we, we use thermocouples for the incoming temperature. Um, Just one more related question. How do you quantify the local PR upstream of your blood body? The local equivalent ratio. Uh, that's uh, from Rayleigh scattering. Um, so the fuel is uh, um, has a higher scattering cross-section than the um, air or combustion products. So you can get essentially a profile. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we get, we get a profile of fuel air ratio there. Uh, yeah. And also stuff that you could publish with us that looks like for my wisdom. We did unvitiated air um, and we didn't have the blob issue with all the stuff. So, is there a uh, like when we are running, I think, how valuable are unvitiated air experiments in an afterburner situation because it's, real, it's not real, realistic, right? So, yeah. so how do you uh, take the data from? Because it's easier to do. Yeah, of course. You just put a heater up frame and heat up there at a certain temperature and then you push the temperature right. and then you ignite your fuel, right? That's what we did. Yeah. If you if actually real if you have a real type combustor in front of it and then yeah. push it through uh, there. How realistic is uh, is electric electric heating? Yeah, um, it's probably fine because the, the main difference is the oxygen um, yeah, content, which you could you could fake. You know, you could you could not have just air. You could you know dilute your air and then electrically heat it, yeah. and you're probably pretty close on that. I mean, there'll be there'll be some quantitative differences. You know, that the CO two and water will have. I mean, your your properties will be a little bit different in the flow, um, but that's not. I don't think that's the critical piece. Um, you know, the, in terms of the of how the flame's behaving, it's you know it's the the fuel air and is determining, and then the temperature is determining your flame speed, and that's really governing the flame behavior. Um, so yeah, the the mixture being different will have different conductivity, and so therefore there'll be some yeah, subtle we differences. Yeah, we were only really doing uh, comparisons of what kind of uh, flame holders, right? So yeah. it didn't matter in that case. But yeah. if you're doing combustion diagnostic, the combustion itself is going to be a little bit. Different as you're Yeah, I mean it'll it'll be different, you know. So you'll get slightly different behavior. But I think if your goal is to um, is to anchor and validate a model, you know, if as long as I'm modeling what I'm measuring, you, you'll test the model well enough in that condition. You know. The oxygen content though is important, you know. So so for us, getting the lower oxygen content is kind of um, critical. 
Um, but but it, it probably wouldn't matter once we did that if we did it electrically or, or um, through vitiation. Yeah. I, don't, I think. <laughs> Never know. Uh, yeah. So, uh, like, you know, earlier slides, did your study kind of concluded that vortex shedding is the cause of the blue hole? For, for these particular conditions, yes. Um, the, it, it, there are other ways in which the flame can become unstable and blow off. Um, so acoustics is another one that can be big. Um, so, so that's a case where um, you have a fluctuation that creates a, a longitudinal acoustic mode, and if that couples to the flame, that can create large uh, variations that, that also can create a blow off. Um, and so it's, it's not like this is the only way in which it happens. Um, you know, we were just, we were studying the way it happens without acoustics. Acoustics is another way, um, you know, so, so there's other, other mechanisms. We have done the acoustics one as, as well. Um, that one's fun. Actually, we did the acoustics one first by accident because it's hard to make these things acoustically silent. So. Yeah, it's very loud, especially uh, just dumping fuel. Yeah. And in the vitiated uh, flows, uh, I can see the noise levels. Are, you know, oh, yeah. I yeah. have the combustion making the noise. Yeah, so, so in, this, in this case, we, we spent a long time, probably a full year, just you know, doing acoustic damping so we could do the non acoustic case. Doing the acoustic case is easy, you just take it off and it sings. <laughs> So, uh, so vortex shedding was not the effect of uh, blue off, right? Right, right. That's that's what we're seeing here. Yeah, yeah. I guess the question that follows hers is: Let's say you start an ER ultrasho. Do you have the ability in your setup to drop that systematically to blow off so that you see the onset of the vortex acceleration as the temperature gradient? Yes. Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, because and that's how we do the experiment. We start at a, a easy to light, stable equivalent ratio, and then do walk it down. So you do you do see the flame shape subtly change and the vort so vorticity it's transitional in some sense, and then you keep driving it eventually. Yeah, when you get close enough, you start seeing a little bit more instability. Yeah. In yeah. So so like if we stopped, you know, point zero one above where we actually get blow off, then we can sit there for you know. Tens of minutes and the flame stable, but yeah, you do see, you do see vorticity more in that case than one at say 0 0.9 that's far. Um, so you can see that increase of, of vor um, vortex shedding in the in the data in that stable flame that doesn't quite blow off. But, yeah. Thank you, Mike. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, I love this thing. Is that yours? No, no, that's that's not. But I'm glad it was here because I just got this one. Um, I, I had a surface for like four years and I didn't replace they put, it. I think they are different ones. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah but this, I, I brought my old connector. And I didn't realize they changed to a different geometry. So I'm glad that was there because I, yeah, yeah, <laughs> I would have been hosed. I forgot that they put, started putting these there because different people are different computers. Yeah. Maybe so. So all these guys, uh, uh, I know you want yeah. to put it in a commercial lab at one time, so. Okay, that'd be great. Yeah, it's all the same. It's the same set part. Okay. It will all be here. So, yeah. so I, you know, Ben, Ben actually, yeah. this, this is, 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 this is